Hello, I am here. I'm Jesse Wiley here with the Institute on Religious Life with Father John Burns. Father, how are you doing today? I'm great, Jesse. Good to be with you all. Really happy to be here. I'm happy to be here too. I'm super excited about our topic today. And uh, you are a priest of the Archdiocese of Chicago. We don't uh, you're kind of a rare breed for this show that we have. Uh, we usually deal with uh, specific, specifically religious, but you have a lot of experience uh, specifically with uh, women religious communities. And so we're very excited to dive into that. But before we start, would you mind leading us in prayer? Yeah, be great. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord, we humbly acknowledge your presence in our hearts and as we gather this way. And we place our lives before your gaze. We invite your Holy Spirit to, to fall upon us and to stir within us all the gifts and graces you've already bestowed. We ask you to expand within us those gifts, Lord, that we would, especially in wisdom, learn to judge things rightly according to your mind and your heart. And that we would cherish and relish the things divine that you have granted to us and for which we evermore deeply long. Let this time be a time anointed for your purposes, Lord, that the kingdom would be extended, your love be ever more widely known, and our lives be ever more perfectly conformed to your most sacred heart. We ask all of this in the name of Jesus, who is our Lord and King forever and ever. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, Amen. the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Well, again, you are a diocesan priest of the Archdiocese of uh, Milwaukee and up in Wisconsin. The, the enemy, so to speak. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, we joked a little bit about our baseball rivalries before the show. But um, usually what we'll do in the beginning of the show is... Uh, explore the personal vocation story to the religious life. But uh, since you're a diocesan priest, I still would like to know, and I think our listeners and watchers out there would still want to know a little bit about how you heard the call to the priesthood and what was that like for you? And perhaps maybe was there an interest in the religious life for you in that in discernment process? Yeah. Yeah, no, it's, uh, these are always sacred moments, you know, sharing the stories so cool as we kind of get to know each other along the way, married as well as religious and priestly uh, stories. They all have similar elements, but also some really unique and personal ones. And I think my story would fall into the category of stories that are like pretty full of struggle <laughs> against God. My little brother's a priest. We're both the awesome priests. And he, uh, while we all struggle, I think on the way, he has known for a long time that the Lord had a certain calling on his life and has had a great affinity with think of God and the church. And that was not the case for me. It was, uh, as my mom would say later, she always knew my brother was called from the cradle, but uh, she never knew what was going to happen with my life. It could go in any direction. And so I think she's as happy as anybody that it didn't go in the thousands of directions. It was pointing at many different points along the way. Uh, I just, I just had a hard time with the Lord. I mean, I, I never really gave up faith, but I think in the end, I grew up really strong willed about my future and aware from a young age of what I was going to need in my own mind to be happy. And so I just told God about that for years. And I built a life around pursuing the things I thought would make me happy in relationships and profession, um, finances, everything. And, you know, progressively, there are moments along the way where I very clearly remember uh, hearing or sensing God without his saying anything about the priesthood, but knowing that to hear the voice, voice of God would, would mean the priesthood. And so I became afraid of God's voice and in turn afraid of silence. And so began to live a busier and busier life, especially after a couple of struggles in high school and college. My family went through an awful lot. My dad was, was sick and left half paralyzed while I was a 15-year-old in high school and shifted our family dynamics. And so that complicated things, I'd say, in our relationship with God. But all that kind of compounded uh, with just growing up and becoming an adolescent and a young adult. And yeah, I just tried to live outside of really listening to God. I wanted a superficial relationship and I checked the boxes, you know, I, I pretty much kept going to church most of the time, but I never really was, I never was like the Lord really come close. The idea of God's voice would mean needing to live behind the world that I had come to love, even though it wasn't making me happy. Um, by the time I was just out of college, I had the job offer I wanted. I had the relationship I thought I'd always needed. Life was tracking for like all that stuff I told God I, I wanted to have. And yet I just felt empty and, and sad and confused. And like Augustine later reading the, the confessions about the rest of the heart, I was like, yeah, that's me for sure. Um, and so it was a couple of pretty dramatic moments, uh, a relationship ending real dramatically and the admission of this relationship was over. 
I must be called to be a priest, which doesn't, there's no like logical flow there. Uh, I just realized the fact that I jumped straight to the priesthood in idea world from this wonderful relationship that I thought would be my marriage uh, made me realize that this question of the priesthood is much deeper than I thought. I had been there kind of beneath the surface as like the dreaded possible outcome of actually listening to God. And so I realized it was time to, to stop running. Um, I went on like a five month long trip kind of contradicting that around. I was backpacking through th- Southeast Asia, Australia, New Zealand, just to try and figure out the world and life and God. And it sounds a little bit over dramatic, but it is. And I ended up on a, a fishing boat, a prawn trawler, which is basically like a big shrimp boat and spent a month at sea fishing. And I kid you not, like in the, it was around Easter time. And uh, one night I'm sitting on the deck and it was like this epic scene. I mean, the sun's going down over the ocean and, when you're out in the ocean, the sun goes down, everything turns just blaze orange. There are dolphins leaping on the horizon. I'm alone on the deck of the cruise inside eating dinner, and I'm mending the nets. And uh, it just kind of like hit me between the eyes. I was like, oh, yeah, I read about this a bunch of times in the book. And I just sort of sat with it, knowing like how really happy I was and how this adventure around the world was not fulfilling anything. And I had all the same questions there that I had when I was back home and that I had in the midst of those relationships and the same fears that sat underneath a lot of that. And in that moment, I just sort of realized holding these material nets, I was like, I, I've been trying to build something uh, on my own foundation for a long, long time. And, uh, yeah, just the real dramatic, really, but the real invitation from the Lord to to leave behind the nets and my efforts and my attempts to fabricate something and uh, just to get home, to get back to where my heart needed to be uh, morally, theologically, spiritually, and, and just begin to really open up the possibility. As soon as I did that, I came back from that trip and met with my bishop and started to really pray. And, you know, a little bit of a weird journey, and I use this in helping young men and women who are discerning, but I didn't really have a great desire for the priest even at that point. And uh, all through seminary, the first like four years of seminary, I didn't really have a great attraction to the priesthood. What I had was evidence that I was becoming happier and happier and more peaceful as I carved the sin out of my life, as I grew in my knowledge of God through the study of scripture and tradition. I became more alive and more human. And that was irrefutable evidence that this process of formation was good. But it really took the Lord a very long time to to get through the layers of my heart and the desires there that I'd built up over time before I actually really desired the priesthood. And uh, that was scary for about a bunch of seminary. Like, I know I can do this, but I don't want to do it. And so what does that say about my heart, Lord? And uh, his patience with me, I think, in the end, he was just trying to to help me work through my own um, my own struggles, but also really own the fact that I was saying yes without being forced but that uh, this was an invitation to love. And, and so, yeah, by, by the third year of theology is when I really started to long for the priesthood, which is um, in seminary formation, that's a lot later than we're kind of looking for that. You no know, one, we'd like to see it earlier, but, but the Lord worked his own way and he's faithful, right? And I just had to learn to be faithful to his fidelity to me and, and to the truth that he has revealed. Uh, and what's amazing about it, I would say, Jesse, is like, I just, I love being a priest. Like, I know every day, I know I'm where I'm supposed to be. And I look at the Lord a lot in that. And I'm like, why, why were you so kind to me as to not let me know (laughs) that this is going to be this good? In other words, how did you almost let me leave seminary a thousand times or go down these thousand and one other paths when you knew it was going to be this good and that I would be this happy? And the answer is always the same. He just wanted to reverence my freedom and never force me into something, even if it's the best thing on earth for me, which is clearly what the priest is. Uh, it's very humbling to admit that like, I didn't even know my heart. I still don't, you know, and I, I really, it's been kind of a, a little bit of a lesson for me to always recognize I might have pretty deep interior certitude, but I need to always uh, turn that over to the Lord and, and be willing to admit that no matter how convicted I might be, God always knows better. And a lot of my life, I've actually been wrong about what's going to be good for me and what I want. That in the end, it's always uh, the wisdom of the church and the gift of God that's going to show the way. So to your other question, I did, uh, I discerned with the Holy Cross, the Holy Cross Fathers. I went to Notre Dame for undergrad and um, not a very active discernment. I went back for visits a few times, talked to their vocation director, sat with it in prayer for quite a long time. And have always, um, out of that, the Lord really invited me clearly to the Aspen Priesthood. But out of that, I've always had a, uh, a sense or a deep love for the evangelical councils and a real question about how diocesan priests ought to be living those 
even though we don't um, vow, you know, we don't take vows around the councils. We have promises and they're a little simpler. Um, but that structure indeed as a council or a set of councils is just magnificent in its beauty and so efficacious in the lives of those that God formally calls. So it's always been a place where I feel poor as a diocesan priest and that we're we're just much simpler. Like we don't have a charism. We don't have vows. We don't have constitutions. We just get out there and try and do the work of the Lord. And that makes it beautiful in its own way, but also like, yeah, sort of free in a way that uh, I love. But also when I'm around um, religious, I'm always very humbled and sort of awed at the at the tremendous beauty of their lives because it's uh, it's such a beautiful life that stands as such a strong witness to the church and to the world. So Anyway, it's a story of, of God's conquest. My gray hair uh, comes from battle, honestly. I came home from seminary. They were like, what happened to you? And I'm like, I know I'm stressing out. Like, I don't want to be a priest, but the Lord wants me to. He wins in the end. And I'm so glad he did uh, because it's since then. It's, I've never once, I'm 11 years a priest. I've never once had a single day or even a period of time during a single day where I was like, I wonder if I, if I messed up or I should be doing something else or if I'm in the wrong life. And, I consider that a great mercy of God and a great gift. And uh, yeah, I just, I love this life. It's such a good life. I'm thinking about the story of your brother knowing very early and, you know, having his whole life to early life to prepare and you struggling and, you know, not taking a so direct route. And it reminds me of the workers in the vineyard uh, getting paid the same wage and getting access to the same uh, heavenly glory, no matter when or how they got there. And it just makes me think of God as the great equalizer. And uh, we all have our own path and our own route. And so in, in the process of discernment, whether it's for married, vocation, religious, how can we take that concept and, and make sure that's a part of our discernment process so that we're not leaving anything on the table that we're, we're super worried about? Yeah, it's a great question. I'd have a, a bunch of kind of directions for an answer, but the, as you speak it, the kind of the clearest thing that rises up is um, maybe just the importance of uh, avoiding comparison and and realizing how deeply personal is the call of God. That that it's a universal call to holiness, but it's it's incarnated, it's instantiated in each person because each heart is unique and unrepeated. And so there's sort of a story or a song of love that is is meant to come forth from each of us in a way that has never really happened before and also is never really going to happen again. And uh, uh, to leave nothing on the table in your phrase there I means just to, to really refer to God more than anything else and, and how, how much a trap. If you're right, looking at my brother's life, I think both of us have looked at each other's lives and been like, man, your life is so different from mine, even though we're both the absolute priests. And I often am edified and sort of um, not ashamed, but like aware that the Lord had to give me more as it were be more patient with me to get me to himself. And that, my brother's excellence really and uh, uh but i see there's no real fruit to comparing except when it comes down to celebrating someone else's journey that it's uh it's just an interior gift that the lord gives a vocation and we have to be willing to really cultivate the type of interior life that can listen to the very subtle promptings of god as he wants to move us toward the fullness that he has for us so yeah just against comparison and toward a constant reference to the face of god and a willingness to to sit down before him and, and be unafraid to hold anything back in the discernment process vocationally, but also then the day-to-day -day discernment. Like I was reading the spiritual exercises again the other day, and Ignatius is like, when you've got a choice and you choose between two options, always choose the one that's going to bring the greater glory to God. I'm like, man, that's so simple. <laughs> like, I don't think about it enough. That would change the way we kind of navigate ongoing discernment too. Like, how can today bring the most glory to God or this choice? Which option does that? Yeah, there's a lot there, obviously, but that's at least a start to an answer. And I think that's probably a conversation maybe for another time where we have you on. But I want to get to the topic at hand, which is how are women religious renewing the church? Now, we invited you out to come and speak at this conference, and uh, the executive director, Jeff Carls, was just blown away, and he wanted to make sure that we had time to discuss a little bit of this on our show here. So, uh, you know, that's that's the topic. Women religious are renewing the church and I guess, first and foremost, why is this something that you feel is on your heart and that, that is very important to you to be able to understand and then convey to other people? Yeah, beautiful. Thanks for the, the open prompt there, too, Jesse. It's a, it's a very deep thing personally for me uh, as, a, as a man and then eventually as a priest in seminary, just a number of encounters with religious sisters, the missionaries of charity specifically. I studied in Rome and we had a, the MCs had a house just down the hill. And I'd go to their soup kitchen a lot 
uh, just to volunteer. And I remember like on a number of occasions seeing the superior, especially, but one of the other sisters too, seeing these sisters, um, running the apostolate, running the house, there's a big soup kitchen and a shelter. And, and then they'd be out in the streets. We go over to the Vatican area just to, to, you know, go see the, the museums and things wherever they went. Uh, I remember being like, man, there's something about that presence, that that feminine consecrated presence that is um, drawing the attention and, and is a certain commanding presence that that I don't see in myself or in other people. Uh, I remember just and it, I didn't have words for it at first. I remember just being awestruck, looking at the superior, especially and saying, I I don't think I've ever seen a woman like that. And and it was a, a pure image. It was a strong image, but it was a perfectly feminine image of loving. And she would, you know, she would chastise as she would encourage. She would, she would fortify and build up as much as she would really challenge the seminarians, myself included, some of the people at the shelter, and then just pilgrims. And I just remember observing that. And then later, other sisters, uh, before again, I was a priest and saying, like, you know, they have a way of conducting themselves, speaking, witnessing, praying, encouraging, inviting that is just different from my way. And there's something that they can say and do that I can't. I can put things in the same words. I can say the same things, but there's a different effect on the heart when a woman says it. And especially when you know that that woman belongs entirely to God. And, and so over the years in studying theology, that became uh, more crystallized and, and affirmed or confirmed within the tradition, magisterial teachings, etc. And then I began to work uh, as a priest with religious communities of women, uh, the MCs, especially, and then the Sisters of Life, and now the Handmaids of the Heart of Jesus, the Carmelites, all these different communities. I've gotten to sit with them on retreats and in spiritual direction. And I just continually grow in my awareness that they're offering to the world is not just some accidental thing that we can do without. Like, yes, when we get into sort of metaphysical conversations, the church could exist without religious women because we need priests to, to bring the sacraments. And that's essential in a different way than maybe um, one might argue the religious woman is. But I'd say for the flourishing of the church, it's essential that we have healthy and holy religious women, precisely because they do something that, that we priests can't do. And from the diocesan perspective, in many of our dioceses where we don't have um, a strong presence of, of women involved in ministry, consecrated religious women involved in ministry anymore, our schools, our parishes. You often, this is the words of a priest from Minneapolis, you often feel like a, a sort of a single parent, uh, you're running a single parent home or like a, a dad without um, anyone else around to help make the decisions or really to call you onward uh, and upward. And and so there's this strange sense of like uh, the functionalism of the diocesan priesthood or the, the utilitarian approach, the, the getting stuck in the doing I think often comes about because we forget that that we're actually fathers and, and really fathers and fathers only fully understand themselves in the, in the light of and in complement to others. And, and there are only fathers and mothers after there is espousal, uh, which is why JP2 talked about the fact that first and foremost, the consecrated vocation is a nuptial meaning to it. And we've got great priests. You know, you're at a seminary. I work at a seminary where I was working to renew the priesthood. I think we've done a lot of really good work in the last couple of decades, starting with Pastoris Dabovobis and John Paul II. Um, I think we have a lot more room to go in, in getting the whole church, not just the religious institutes, but the whole church to be as vitally concerned for the health and well-being of women's vocations and religious women, because they bring to something, they bring to the church something that um, when it's absent, we feel it, but we don't realize that it's gone. And in its absence, we're not really able to fully flourish because they bring in the most perfect form, uh, the image of, of the woman cleaving to Christ in, in a spousal relationship that bestows upon the church a deeper awareness of who she is as a bride in a manner that you and I as men and even as a priest consecrated, but still as a man, I just can't do it the same way. And so I just remember growing up and feeling like something was missing. When I saw it in Rome and the sisters, I was like, oh, that's something new. And then I studied and I realized, and actually that's that's what was missing. And if we if we all work to bring that to where it should be, the way that I believe God wants it to be in all of our dioceses, all of our parishes, all of our communities, we're going to watch the church wake up and come to life, a flourishing fullness of life in a manner that uh, I think we're all starving for. We don't even realize it. I've got some images I can share on that, but we'll see where the conversation. Sure. Uh, so you use the word flourish a lot, and I think that's really important because we talk about you know, one of my favorite uh, scripture passages is John 10.10. 10. 
Uh, he came so that mm. we might have life, not just life, but life to the full. And so uh, what, uh, you know, flourish or fullness of, you know, being able to see our role in, you know, this, this whole thing, of Christianity and preaching the gospel. And, and uh, that, that's what I think is really important, that it's complementary. And you kind of alluded that to, to that as well. So how, how do we see in the church that feminine, com, complem, uh, how that complements everything that we see? You know, most people say the church, oh, it's the priest, they're running the, the sacraments, you know, all that type of stuff. But uh, can we dive a little more into that, that flourish and how that really, in a detailed way, complements the, the church, the body of Christ? Yeah, that's, a, that's the key right there. And, and even maybe to get into sort of archetypal realities or, or the most fundamental levels of identity here, the church we know is the bride of Christ. And um, so this, this idea of the feminine, it's all through the scriptures. It goes back to Eve and then, and then all of the, the, the prophetic literature in, in referencing Israel as the bride. And then eventually the church coming forth from Christ's side as, a, as a, like the new Eve or, or the new Adam giving birth to the church, the, the, the new bride from his side and then revelation. The, the reality of the feminine is it's, it's all through the – you can't understand the church in, in deeply theological and, and biblical terms without access to the authentically and profoundly feminine. What I think is hard for us, especially guys, is it's hard to understand how as a church – I'm a member of the baptized and then now as a priest as well. And you as married, how we're members of the bride and how we are bridal in our relationship to Christ. Cause we know that there's only one eternal marriage. It's Christ and the church or the wedding feast of the lamb we see in revelation. But it's very strange to figure out what it means to live into that. And it, it's a, it's a mystery. It's not meant to be fully understood by us here in the flesh. And yet it's also so profoundly central to our faith that it's something we always have to be exploring. And what, uh, as you talk about getting into what this looks like, this is really the, the place that the religious woman is able to take up, as well as the consecrated virgin within the church. That, that where she is, especially when, when religious life of women is flourishing well, or to use that word again, or is living fully, there's always a Marian dimension that, that is helping us to access this deep archetypal foundation of femininity. That uh, there's a reason that religious communities of women most typically take Mary in their name, but also their spirituality revolves around a devotion to Our Lady. These are devotional and pietistic elements, but they're, they're touching upon the fact that Mary's the new Eve and she shows us the bride. And so she's giving us a face for the church that, that what can be said as the saints have said, what can be said of Mary can be said of the church and vice versa. But we don't see Mary ourselves easily beyond our spiritual life and, and the world of art. Which is why the, the, the real uh, depth of, of religious life of women is almost always anchored in or should always be tied back to Mary. Because if Mary gives the church a face, uh, the, the religious woman gives Mary a face and really does personify the bride for us. Which I, I would argue is why that works something up in us when we see it. Like that was my experience in seminary. I see these sisters. I'm like, I felt like I was understanding myself and not just because they're women. I'd been seeing women my whole life, but they did something different in my heart. And I think that's why uh, we have that experience. You bring sisters into your parish or you go somewhere where you don't normally see sisters and see sisters. Everybody's kind of gravitating toward them. I believe that's that's pulling at the deep the deep layer of the heart or the heartstrings that recognize uh, we're discovering something of who we are as a church. Whenever we interact with these women who are very confident in their consecrated identity as women belonging to Christ in a spousal bond. And so we don't have that. We don't really get who we are and it's hard to do good ecclesiology, good theology. When we have that in place, there's no competition and there's a balancing out that in the end, I think solves a lot of the problems for our theology, of the priesthood, our theology of religious life, but also our theology of marriage, because we've got good priests to look at. Please God, that shows us the Christ side of that, eternal, everlasting marriage, we need to see the, the bridal side as well, for marriage to understand itself, for the priesthood to understand itself, and for religious life to understand itself. They're all related, and when any one part is missing, um, something's off. I don't know if you've you ever heard this thing about the wolves. I, I tell this story a lot, but the wolves in Yellowstone, it's this really cool thing from nature that instructs us about supernature. But back in the early 1900s, 20s and 30s, the wolves in Yellowstone were were hunted out of the park because the farmers, they were a problem, you know, for the crops and livestock. 
And so the wolves basically disappeared in the, by the 40s. No wolves were sighted in, in Yellowstone. And we just got used to that being the, the status of the park until some uh, conservationists in the 90s started to say, you know, there were wolves here since the park was established until the 40s. So shouldn't we recognize that's maybe a part of the natural system or ecosystem of the church? So they began to reintroduce the wolves in 95. And there's a lot of studies on this, and some of them contradict each other. But everybody agrees that immediately when the wolves came back into the into the, the park, everything started to shift around. And specifically, the elk and the deer that were grazing on the, the plains along the river in the south part of the park, the wolves started to hunt them, and the elk and the deer moved up off those plains into safer places in the woodlands or the highlands. It caused an immediate regeneration of the flood plains. Uh, wildflowers and trees within a handful of years quintupled in height which brought back new bird populations, new rodent populations, as well as um, with this canopy cover on the river, new, new tree structures that fortified the riverbanks through the root systems, which changed the, be the beaver behavior in the rivers, uh, which led them to build new dams and create new eddies. And that actually changed the behavior and eventually the course of the rivers in the park, all because the wolves were brought back. A buddy was explaining that to me and I was like, it sat really well or it made sense with me. And I, I started to realize that the church is kind of like the park in that there is a, an original status supernaturally established by God with its elements that, that are harmoniously meant to abide together. Something um, has, has drifted away in, in a lot of parts of the church. We have religious in many places, but, but in other places, it's just harder to find a religious community or, or it's maybe their involvement is, is less visible or even liminal. And, and I think we just kind of adjusted to that, sort of like the park did uh, as a correlate. We just got used to this way. We changed our hiring. We changed our budget structures. We changed the way we do a lot of ministry and said, well, this is the new normal. But in the end, like, I think we need to ask the question about if this is supposed to be the new normal or if, if something sort of disappeared unnaturally, that's supposed to be there supernaturally. And we need to make sure to, to pour into a restoration effort and, and watch what happens in the, if you will, the ecosystem of the church when an essential element to its original structure is restored, which in the end causes a rebalancing and a reshift of everything. So I just believe nature there is very instructive and there's this really cool opportunity to, to think about that on the supernatural and the ecclesiastical plane and watch what happens if we all get serious about the renewal of women's religious life. Well, I think we, uh, we definitely should start uh, calling uh, religious superiors den mothers now. I think that would be pretty, yeah, no, exactly. pretty appropriate uh, <laughs> for the little wolf pack there. So, uh, well, uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention this, this book that you wrote uh, that, that you definitely want to promote. Um, what is the name of this book? And I'll, I'll post a link to it on, online, but just give me a little bit about uh, what, what the title is and what it's about. Yeah, it's, it's called Lift Up Your Heart. It's a 10-day personal retreat with St. Francis de Sales, who's a patron of the diocese here in Milwaukee and a, a dear spiritual friend of mine. And I basically just took his meditations. He begins his introduction to the vow life with a series of 10 meditations on the four last things, on the commitment to, to live for heaven, on conversion. And I wrapped them in language that's a little more approachable and accessible to the kind of contemporary reader. I wrote it in front of the Blessed Sacrament, honestly, in like 10 days. It just kind of flowed out of my my hands and heart into my computer. It wasn't intended to be a book, but it later was published and um, has been just a kind of a private or personal retreat or a resource for small groups or parishes to to ask those big questions about heaven and hell, death, judgment, and, and what's my life? What am I doing with my life? Where is it pointing? So it's a short book, but um, it's, it's ended up blessing a lot of people more than I would have expected. I'm very humbled by it. And I donate all the proceeds that I get back to our, our seminary to help with priestly formation. So it's published by Ivan Maria Press. Again, it's a lift up your heart, a 10 day personal retreat with St. Francis de Sales. Thanks for, uh, yeah, reminding me. To bring <laughs> yeah, that up. no problem. I, I post a link to that in the, in the comment section here. And uh, before we close, uh, would you mind giving myself and everybody watching a blessing? Sure. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Gracious God, we thank you for teaching us to love you, to love your work, to love the gift of your church, and to welcome your love in our lives as you draw us forth in our vocational pathways and the pathways of ministry evangelization and the apostolate. And I ask that you would pour your Holy Spirit, Lord God, please, upon everyone who's with us now, everyone who will watch later. 
that anything here that doesn't resonate, Lord, or that stands against your will would be set aside, and everything here that does would uh, be affirmed, would be deepened, and would bear a rich fruit, so that the church would become ever more the bride that you wish her to be, that each of us would become ever more the men and women you've called us to be, and that we would rejoice in the gift of our faith, which calls us to run together toward eternal life and to bring with us as many as we can. Through the intercession of the Blessed Virgin Mary, the prayers and protection of St. Joseph, her most chaste and holy spouse, the friendship of all the angels and saints, may Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you, Father, so much for your time. We hope to have you on the show again. And thank you, and God bless. Yeah, great to be with you. God bless you all. Take care.